This week, Joe Gray returns to the show from the Advanced Persistent Security Podcast to talk about social engineering. And we figured while we're talking about social engineering, we'd have Patrick, Patrick Laverty back in the studio as well to talk about the SERI Conference, Social Engineering Rhode Island Conference. Uh, our technical segment for this evening will be a Docker Security Incident Lessons Learned. It's actually a security incident that happened here at Security Weekly that I talked about at Source Boston this week, and I'll disclose with you some of the details on a malicious Docker container that was uploaded to one of our Docker servers. In the security news, while there's always Twitter, we could always talk about that, uh, as well as um, bug bounties for bad algorithms, uh, Microsoft patches two zero-day flaws, and so much more. Paris Hilton. You said Paris Hilton. Paris Hilton coming Paris up. Paris Hilton. All that and more on this edition of Paul's Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly. For security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and the cocktails flow steady. It's Paul's Security Weekly. Welcome. Does Larry have an introduction? Hi, everyone. This is Paul. That's the I guess I'm, I'm introducing... Uh, apparently, I no longer do. Okay. <laughs> wow, and I look short. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I accidentally uh, landed in New England and uh, stumbled my way to the G-Unit studio. That's pretty much how I envisioned it happening. Yeah. Job. <laughs> oh. Carlos, ha save the show, please. <laughs> yes, somebody's got to do it. <laughs> Cannot be saved. Uh, uh, well, it's good to have you back, Carlos. Jeff, welcome. Nice to have you in studio. It's great to be here, Paul. Try to stay awake for the whole episode. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We've been in studio dropping his phone incessantly while we're chatting. What? what? We're. Oh, hey. I'm, I'm in the studio with you guys. <laughs> That's kind of cool. Um, <laughs> NetSparker, the developers of desktop and cloud-based web application security scanners that enable you to automatically identify vulnerabilities in your web applications and web services. NetSparker scanners employ a unique and dead-accurate vulnerability scanning engine that automatically verifies vulnerabilities with their proof of concept. For more information, visit them on the web at netsparker.com or email at contact at netsparker.com. In 2017, an increasing number of companies reported they did not have effective insider threat detection methods. Logarithm's UEBA solutions enable you to detect and neutralize user-based threats in real time, while built-in scenario and behavior-based analytics empower you to expose insider threats, compromised accounts, and privilege misuse. Visit Logarithm.com to learn how their UEBA solutions can help you expand visibility and enhance detection capabilities. Welcome to the show. But first, let me introduce you to a man who looks darn good with a clean haircut. Paul Asadorian. I'm just trying to be like you, Keith. Thank you very much. <laughs> Going with the, the bald is beautiful look. Uh, All right. At least I got the bald part down anyway. So <laughs> welcome everyone to Paul's Security Weekly. We got an exciting show for you this evening in studio to my left is none other then Patrick Laverty. Now, wait, you, you still work at Rapid7, right? I still okay. work at Rapid7. Okay. And what's yeah. your title at Rapid7 again? Uh, security consultant. Security consultant. Yeah. What type of consulting do you do at Rapid7? I do penetration testing. That's awesome. It's a whole lot of fun. And I feel like I have a little bit too much hair for this show. You, yeah, you need to shave it, dude. All Just right, we'll, we'll certainly work on that. We'll do that at live at SERI. Okay, that sounds good. What, what's SERI? We're going to talk about We're that? We're going to talk about that conference okay. that awesome. you're organizing. I, oh, yeah. I hope you know what it is. <laughs> And uh, we should be, we're going to shave Patrick's head for, for charity, I think is what we're just announced on the show. Oh, I, I think so. <laughs> yes. It's on uh, Citizen Pipes Foundation. On uh, the lines via Skype, Mr. Jeff Mann is here with us. Jeff, welcome. Good to be back, Paul, as always. <clears throat> I feel like I've missed a week or two, but uh, been out there uh, pounding, the, pounding the pavement, pressing the flesh on behalf of security. You almost said pounding the flesh. You almost got that <laughs> mixed almost up. Did, but you, I did. You caught yourself, thankfully. Uh, uh, Jeff, you were at the ISC Squared Congress. Was that the name of the event? Uh, it was called Secure Summit DC. It was okay. at National Harbor, Maryland. And I, I ran into, uh, oddly enough, uh, John Strand was there. Yes. And I, I almost ran into Dave Kennedy. He was uh, there very briefly. And, uh, you know, a few other people. And uh, apparently everybody had to go up to uh, hack New York City, which was like moments later. 
but uh, yeah, and because we were at Source Boston, and a lot of those conferences were semi overlapping and overlapping. sometimes directly overlapping. So uh, I think there's probably if you like put down all the security conferences, they probably all overlap now, or, or it seems that way. Infosec, there's just a there's a lot of them. InfosecEvents.net used to track that. I believe they still do. I'm not mm. sure how. I haven't like done a check to see like, exactly like how thorough uh, they are, but there's, it's always been a great free resource, uh, you know, that we've mentioned in the past. So, um, if it's not up to date, maybe help them keep it up to date would be my advice to the security community. Uh, Keith Woodlet is here with us this evening. Keith, welcome. Thank you very much. Bald is in fact beautiful, Paul. We, uh, you know, we missed here. you at uh, at Source Boston, you know. Yeah, you know, it's, it's tough with my new role as solutions architect at Bug Crowd. Um, my calendar literally looks like someone tried to cram 16 hours of work into an eight hour day. Uh, so, yeah, I unfortunately could not make it down. But uh, I heard it was an excellent time and I heard you gave a pretty good talk. Yeah, I talked mistaken. to some of your uh, cohorts and partners in crime. Uh, Casey, talk to Casey. We're going to bring Casey on the show. Casey Dunham. Excellent. Um, we talked with Apollo. Actually, Apollo came on Enterprise Security Weekly that we for the not the first time but the first time in a really long time recorded a show live uh at a conference and i believe for the maybe the first time we streamed it live on sure. that's cool we've done some audio live streaming from events like way back in the day but this was the first kind of reinvention of ourselves um with some new equipment and actually streaming live to youtube from a conference so source was the first conference we did that and we hope to replicate that for Black Hat and DEF CON, I don't want to give away the details just yet, but stay tuned for announcements on that front. That could be a whole lot of fun to have at DEF CON, especially a little bit later in the evening. Wait till you see what we got planned, dude. It's I, <laughs> I can't wait. It's going to be epic. Um, so with us is Joe Gray from the Advanced Persistent Security Podcast. Joe, welcome to the show this evening. Thanks for having me. It's nice to have you uh, on the show. It was nice seeing you uh, at Source. It looks like you're still at Source because that... Hotel, well, all hotel rooms look pretty much exactly the same, but it looks like you're in the hotel at Source Boston. I will give up my OPSEC. I am still in the hotel for Source Boston. Uh, I fly out tomorrow. Excellent, excellent. And so, Joe, start off by telling us what um, you were doing at Source Boston. And did you give a workshop and a presentation or just a presentation? I did two presentations, actually. Okay, I knew there was multiple activities, but both were presentations. Joe's a busy guy. Busy guy. Uh, very much so. Um, so yesterday I gave my Decepticon talk, which is uh, an OPSEC talk geared from the lens of someone who does OSINT investigations for the purpose of social engineering. So basically, instead of saying, I do all of these things, look at my tinfoil fedora, I say, I do this to actually try to attack for social engineering purposes. Here are some things you can do to make my life harder. Uh, and then the one today was... I forget the exact title, but I could summarize it as basically uh, phishing for awareness. It was considerations uh, for building internal phishing programs in terms of how to plan it, how to execute it, how to measure the metrics of it, the efficiency, some training tidbits, and then, of course, some of the uh, OSINT material about how to gather some OSINT and then some uh, ideas about things to do for running the phishing campaigns and kind of how I do it. But Joe, I want to ask you a question about uh, OSINT. Um, there were two different uh, folks who asked me a kind of similar question. Basically, the question was, look, we've got very important people that work for our organization, and they could be attacked in a couple of different ways. One, someone could register that person's, very important person's name on a social media network or some email service, and impact the Google results for that person's name such that they put bad things in the Google results when you search for that person's name, which I think is really mean and no one should ever do that. I think that's awful. So their question was, how do I, one, clean it up and how do I prevent this in the future? Uh, the, the second uh, question stemmed from, we have very important people. We haven't had an incident yet, but those important people are worried about registering, uh, other people registering for a free email service under their name and then sending out a phishing attack against the organization or impersonating them in some way. Now, I had, um, in, in one case, it probably should be in, in both cases too, 
uh, a, a particular vendor in mind uh, that does this. I think it's one of the very few. I don't know. I'll give them a free plug on the show because they were the first ones that came to mind. Good job on Zero Fox on your marketing efforts because that's the vendor that, that comes to mind to help organizations with this problem. Now, I don't know uh, to what extent because I didn't really have a detailed conversation with Zero Fox about this issue, um, but I want to get your thoughts and the panel's thoughts on how you might combat this issue. So I would actually recommend that these important people go off and create social media accounts to own their image. Sure. Uh, that's one of the pieces of, of advice I give during the Decepticon talk. Uh, I always ask who in the audience does not have a social media account. And usually one or two people will raise their hand. And I, I quickly point out that their siblings, their spouse, their children, their friends, their employer, someone near them has a social media account. And if we wanted to look at it from the perspective of Skynet, they are already known. So I'm, I'm a bigger advocate of not avoiding it, but rather embracing it and owning your image. And then if someone tries to do fraudulent things like create a free email account with your name, um, just make your email account public, honestly, um, unless you're in Europe and it's after May 25th because technically that would be uh, a violation of GDPR. But um, with that being said, make it very well known or even, you know, be on like Keybase or another um, key server so that people could actually verify your authenticity. Uh, understanding that doing PGP type stuff may be a little bit too advanced for some people, um, but people within the community, not so much. Mm. Yeah, I don't. If what are you, if you're saying that if I make my own email address public, that it could be a violation of GDPR. Email addresses uh, under GDPR are actually considered PII, even a work email address. And even if you leak your own, that part's where it gets tricky. The law but doesn't Paul's not in the EU. Another What's that? Good, another good observation. Yeah, what if I'm not <laughs> in Paul, the EU? Paul is not in the EU. Right. Well, I was providing the adv the advice from the perspective of. In the U.S., it's not a big deal, but if you are in the EU after May 25th, it could be problematic. So that's something that I would consult your legal counsel before doing. So Joe, don't Joe's try me. this. I'm not a lawyer. In angle. Yeah, I like that. It's a good angle. I, I, I don't even. I don't even. Uh, well, actually, I'm not a lawyer, but um, later on uh, after, after the show, when I uh, uh, go meet up uh, with uh, some of the people from the conference for dinner. Um, I might uh, just uh, impersonate one and do some live social engineering on the street. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Joe, at the beginning there, you said uh, one of the things that you do uh, in your talks is kind of give people tips on how to make your job harder. What's probably like the number one easiest thing that anybody could do to make your job harder when you're trying to gather intelligence to perform social engineering against them or against a company? Uh, privacy controls, honestly. Um, so I, I'll frame this from the perspective of the social engineering capture the flag competition because the report is out there. People can go read it. They can see uh, some of the statistics with it. They can read the flags and see what uh, exactly we were looking for. Um, I didn't. I actually didn't get first place in the OSINT portion of the competition. I actually got second place. And basically what I did is I found as much about the company as I could on a company level. And then after I moved from the company level, I started identifying users and go digging through their social media, their Twitter, their LinkedIn, their Facebook. And a lot of the flags that I got were because people did not have things set to friends only or friends of friends on Facebook. There was a guy who had a picture of his badge, uh, his old badge and his new badge. And basically, I, I think it, the comment was something to the effect of, I've been here for five years and I look more like a serial killer or something. It was meant to be funny. But ultimately, I saw exactly what the badge looked like, and zooming in a little bit more, I could definitely take it further. Mm. So I would say first and foremost that be cognizant of the username you use and how it impacts the URL. For example, with Facebook, your username is your URL. So if you, um, you know, if Jeff Mann decides he wants to go create a Facebook, assuming he didn't have one, he could go and create one, and it would be Jeff dot Mann or Jeff dot Mann and a bunch of numbers. Or he could just make it something completely oblivious. Uh, or it could just be the standard numeric string as well. But you've got to watch out on the um, the vanity URL piece of it as well with your personal accounts. Of course, with a business account, you want to do that because you want to be discovered. And what kind of advantage does somebody like you have, Joe, where Joe Gray is not you know, really a unique name? There's 
probably lots of people out there that have that kind of name. Does that make it a lot harder for you when you're kind of doing your, your research and your gathering? Well, I don't use my real account for any of that. So, um, so I don't have to worry about showing up in people that should be known uh, because that's a risk you run. When you view someone's profile numerous times, you may show up in people they may know. Um, so, and I won't synchronize a contact, a contact list as well, because that's another way you can end up there. So, uh, for me, fortunately, I have a couple of accounts, uh, some in my name, some not. Uh, and I know I said a couple, but I'm meaning more than that. So several may be a more appropriate number. Um, but the other thing is my dad is also named Joe Gray and he's not necessarily, he's definitely not an in industry. Uh, he doesn't like to be found. Uh, I'll tell you a funny story about him in a moment, but um, he does disinformation as well without realizing it's disinformation. Um, and and the, the funny joke on him is uh, at one point he posted a picture to his Facebook page from his Android phone uh, that he had taken off his front porch bragging about, I've moved to the mountains, I'm off the grid. It's like you just posted this with a Google device to Facebook. <laughs> grid. Um, does it, does it actually lock the, well, you, but like you said, privacy settings are important because a lot of what you talked about is depending on the social media network controllable via your privacy settings, correct? Yes. Wh which aspects are most important across all the social media networks as an example to control in your privacy settings? So with Twitter, it's pretty much wide open. You've either got a protected account or it's wide open. Mm. Uh, if someone starts stalking you, you block them, but it's like a gray hair. You pull that one and five more go up. Uh, so with that one, you really got to be careful uh, with what you post to Twitter. Instagram, there's a lot of OSINT to be gathered from the pictures um, just for the fact that you never know what's in the background, what's in the reflection. Um, most social media platforms now have started scrubbing the metadata, so you don't have to worry about that. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, I would say access controls uh, as well as enumerating your relationships. So if I want to find out your mother's maiden name, if I'm doing it on the street, I'm going to say, what was your mom's name before she was married? Because we're not conditioned to protect against that. Whereas if I say, what's your mother's maiden name? People are going to yell at me and say, get out of my face. Uh, on social media, you can very easily go and look. And if someone has it to where people can publicly view your relationships, I can go and get your mother's maiden name. And then I can go get her mother's maiden name. And then if I want to validate that, then I can use a website like Family Tree Now or uh, True People Search um, with a shout out to Michael Basil and the Intel Techniques uh, website where I use those tools very heavily. I can compare that information and validate it for accuracy. Um, or I could just go to an Ancestry site as well. <clears throat> yeah, that's interesting. I hadn't considered that, that a lot of... Uh a lot of people put their uh, maiden name and their married name in their Facebook profile so that so that they can get found. people can find them. Right. Yep. So it sounds like, Joe, it really what you're talking about is the best thing to do is to set up a, all these social media accounts, but then never use them. It's a measured risk uh, because, you know, the, the people on the show, we're all on Twitter. Um, and I know most of us, if not all of us, are on Facebook. We actually communicate. We post information. Like for myself, I post where, what my upcoming speaking engagements are. Keith posts his daily productivity uh, and so on. So it, it's just a measured risk. Um, that's why I'm very adamant about I control the data that's out there about me. It's for Facebook. If you tag me in a Facebook post, I have to approve it before it shows up on my profile. Yeah, I have uh, that setting as well. Ahead, so interesting I, I use that I almost take the uh, other approach Honestly, to it. I have an Instagram, but I don't really use it. And um, like Snapchat, that's a whole new creature. Um, that I, I'm really conflicted. I know there's a lot of fun stuff with it, like a Snap Map uh, that you can look and uh, enumerate like hashtags and what people are talking about. But um, I've not really embraced that for uh, heavy OSINT use yet. So, Keith, you had a question? Joe, I have a quick I have a quick question for you. So I almost take the opposite approach. Uh, so I, for for example, I haven't had Facebook since 2013. I just got rid of LinkedIn earlier in the year, uh, mostly because it ended up being spam. Um, like for me, I know that like when I go and try to do OSINT against myself, 
I have a harder time finding most of uh, my information. And now there are things that I'm trying to do to actively remove some of that information online. Um, but for people that try to kind of disappear from the grid, does that at all make it hard for you? Uh, I mean, like we know each other, right? So it's one of those situations where um, I am, I'm sure you could probably OSINT your way through a lot of the stuff that I have. But I'd be curious to know if it's harder for people that are have effectively erased their footprint uh, in certain aspects. It is. Um, and, and that's really what Decepticon aims to talk about. That, that's what that talk is about. Um, so for the average American citizen that's not privacy conscious, I can find out pretty much anything I want to know. Um, I don't go looking for things like socials, and I honestly don't go looking for passwords, but pretty much anything about their personal life that I could use to build a pretext to send them a fish or anything of the sort, I can find that in about five minutes or less. Uh, it might be seven to ten if I'm using my phone as opposed to a computer. So it's really not challenging on that side. Um, but even disappearing from social media, you still have to worry about everything that's on archive.org. Um, so a few resources that I would recommend. Uh, if you're very serious about it, I would definitely read Michael Basil's Hiding from the Internet. Uh, um, J.J. Luna has a book as well. I the, the title escapes me. Michael Basil actually wrote the forward. Uh, Micah Hoffman on his uh, OSINT.ninja website actually has op he has a lot of opt-out links. So all of the sources that we would go to looking for OSINT, uh, if it has an opt-out policy, he's got a link to it in this Google Doc. So uh, you can always reach out to him. He's on Twitter at WebBreacher. Um, he could definitely point you in the right direction for opting out of things. Um, another thing, and this is taking from a little bit from Michael's philosophy as well, uh, within the Intel Techniques forum, uh, users will pair with each other uh, somewhat periodically, and they will actually run OSINT investigations against each other. Because, Keith, when you run OSINT on yourself, you already know the answers. So you're going to kind of turn a blind eye and say, eh, you know what, uh, I don't use that website, I'm not even going to look. Whereas if I were running OSINT against you, I'm going to check a lot of other places because I don't have that full profile on you, and I might find some things that you didn't know about or even some imposter accounts claiming to be you. Fair point. Fair point. And that's one of those things that it's interesting as well, too, for like the idea of imposter accounts, right? Because uh, I imagine that they definitely exist. But for me, kind of the way that I keep my social network alive is, you know, things like this and Twitter, obviously. But uh, most of the people I know have my phone number uh, and I have theirs. And so it's one of those situations where I imagine if they were to find an imposter account, they'd probably just text or signal or call me. Um, and that could be the case. Yeah, I hope. Yeah. Well, actually, it's funny that we're having this conversation here, and it's it's even more ironic that Jack's not here because um, Jack and I recently became Facebook friends, and um, I, I have a, a few security study groups you know, on Facebook, and uh, I scrutinize the users. I look and say, is this a real account? Is this what's the age of the account? Um, and then I ask questions. If they don't answer those, they don't get in. Well. I'm half awake first thing in the morning clearing my notifications, and for one of the groups, I see that Jack Daniel has requested to join the group. I'm like, okay, totally, cool. But then I realize this Jack does not have a profile picture. And I go digging a little bit further. In the URL, the, the name in the URL was not Jack Daniel. And then because I knew Jack, I was like, um. So I did the whole Facebook report that this is impersonating someone I know, and it sent a link to Jack. He looked at it, and uh, I don't know what the outcome was, but, I mean, that's just a perfect example. Jack is a very well-known person in the community um, worldwide. So when I saw that imposter account, I was like, hey there, Jack. Is it a violation of all major social media uh, providers that impersonation is the a violation of the terms of service? Technically. It, uh, I've also heard Paul... Go ahead, Keith. Speaking of, of that as well, I've heard that um, specifically like Twitter, I think, is the big one that's known for it. Is anybody that tries to register for a kind of verified account, the easiest way to get a verified account effectively is to basically show that someone is trying to impersonate who you are, right? Mm. Um, oh, so cool. that, that's what I've heard in terms of at least the major social media platforms is you can effectively kind of get those, um, you know, checkmark accounts if, in fact, someone is trying to actively impersonate, impersonate you. Mm. So we, we've got a, a Twitter hack here, which right now I, I know that Twitter verification has turned off because they verified a bunch of troll accounts or something. But when it comes back, hey, there's going to be a Twitter hack. Just get someone to impersonate you for a while and you can get a verified account. Mm. Hmm. 
Not actually a bad idea. I was, you know, ironically, I was kind of thinking of the same thing, but my friends at Twitter would probably be like, Keith, what the hell are you doing? Um, so I didn't really it mention it until now. Yeah. Well, going towards terms so. of service, if if you, what if you're creating accounts that aren't you, but you're not trying to impersonate anyone else, you just have other accounts. Is that really just strictly limited by the email addresses you can create? And what are the other verification methods and, and how do the, they handle that in the terms of service? So to a degree, um, it's a violation of terms of service. But with that being said, violation of terms of service, if you're not doing something to make waves or get noticed yep. and, enfor and being enforced, it's two completely different monsters. Um, but with that, um, if you're just being quiet about it and you're not trying to impersonate someone and no one reports you, you're probably not going to get noticed. So when creating some fake accounts for OSINT purposes, I, I toyed with a few different things. Uh, a lot of the websites, they request a phone number to verify you. Mm -hmm. So I, I have sudo app. And with sudo, you can get a sudo phone number that can send and receive calls and texts, um, but it's not your real phone number. So I tried to register to all three of them with a sudo number, and I was shut down uh, very quickly. Uh, I've not attempted it with a Google uh, voice number, but that's definitely a possibility as well. And I also learned that some social medias don't like you to try to use Tor when you register as well. So you're still going to Facebook.com. You're just using Tor as your browser. Yeah. I how get, effective? Go ahead, Keith. I was gonna say, how effective is it to like go buy a burner phone uh, and try using one of those, right? So, in my mind, whenever I've gone and done this sort of thing, I've always basically just gone, paid cash for a burner phone, uh, bought a you know a time card that can get texts, and then register up a bunch of accounts and call it a day. Yeah, I mean, if you're really serious about having several fake accounts. Absolutely, that would that would certainly work. Is that to support your money laundering or drug business, Keith? Or <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just uh, I learned a thing or two from the wire, and uh, and when it comes to actually tracking back, you know, um, the provenance of an account and a phone number, it's much harder to do with cash first and foremost because those records don't live forever. It's the records of the tape of the video camera, which. Nowadays, those records might live forever, but it, it takes, you know, visual um, confirmation thereof. So for me, it's like, yeah, if I wanted to have uh, an account that I could easily set up that wasn't actually my real name, uh, but I didn't want to go the way of, of what Joe is suggesting, it's pretty easy to get uh, time card numbers from like a local, you know, supermarket. And therefore, if you, as long as you've got the phone, you can just reload that with a new number anytime you go and buy a new time card. And Keith, it yep. could probably save you sure. a little, little bit of money now. Uh, I'm seeing some of those throwaway email services now also take texts. There you go. Even better. So right? You don't even so need a burner uh, phone anymore. Right. Yeah. Right. So it's like um, you now even don't need the hardware. Yeah, hey, I've got a uh, service agreement question. It seems like in the last week or two, just about every app on my phone, which is most mostly social media apps, is you know as I've launched it, it's got a pop up saying something to the effect of. We've changed our service agreement recently in our terms of service. You know, please click here to accept everything. I'm assuming that's because of recent Facebook stuff. Has anybody else nope. seen that? Heard anything about it? GDPR. It's, I'm sure yeah, it's due to GDPR. To it's Facebook. all GDPR. Mm. Gotcha. Um, but I'm, I'm sure Facebook was an impetus to get them to do it a little bit faster than they were planning on. Uh, but it's definitely GDPR because if you look the explicit date, it'll say some effective date like May 25th. Who looks at the details on anything like that? Come on now. There's actually a website that does look at them for you if you want to take a look at it and get the layman's non-lawyer terms uh, of the terms of service, and it's tosdr.org. So basically, terms of service didn't read.org. Hmm. Cool. I like, I've never heard of that site before. I learned something. That is new. awesome. You are dropping knowledge bombs left yes. and right. Chad. This is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> That's really cool. So... Joe, in your uh, other presentation that you gave up there at Source, where you were talking about uh, using phishing to build a successful awareness program, one of the questions that I've gotten a lot of times is, where really is the line with companies doing their own phishing testing and the employees being able to, to trust the management of the company? How often should you trust? What, what's your kind of thoughts on that kind of thing? So I'm conflicted on, on the phishing side. There are two things that I say straight out of the gate that companies should not be doing. And that is OSINT uh, collecting on their employees. You, you need to maintain that level of trust and privacy between work and home and vishing. Uh, 
number one, because it's easy to blow up in your face. And number two, it's going to skew your internal results because it's a, it's a little bit more time consuming. So I definitely recommend hiring uh, a consulting firm to come in and do it. I mean, anyone, anyone who does pen testing typically does those two things as well on the social engineering side. Um, but in terms of phishing, my thought is you should definitely do it uh, probably quarterly uh, at a minimum, ideally monthly. And you should communicate to your employees that it's happening. Let them know, hey, we're sending fish. If you receive something that you believe is a fish, forward it to this email account, which is phishing at your company's domain, and our security team will take a look at it. And then that way, if you do a phishing campaign and everybody sends it to it, then you know it's working. Because where a lot of modern phishing campaigns right now are going wrong. They're worried about how many times the emails opened, how many times, how, how long they sit and read the email. Understanding that malicious things can happen from the email window. I totally understand that. Um, I'm more focused on three other metrics. How much, how many people gave me sensitive data? I don't validate the data to verify that it's legit. It's just, did they give me any data? because I usually ask for email address, password, and four password reset questions. And then the other things, did it get reported? And if so, what was the response time? Because that's that's a real world thing. I don't care how long someone sits and <clears throat> reads an email. I mean, could it be, could it do an attack? Absolutely, but more than likely, your, your malware protection should pick that up. Cool. And uh, I, I'm assuming that when you get the results back or when the company gets the results back on the, the people that did well and the ones that might not have done so well, you, usually the answer for the ones that didn't do so well is just obviously more training. Flog them? Mm -hmm. What? No. Well, that no, that doesn't work. Oh, I mean, I guess it could, but... It could. Well, I don't recommend it. I was yeah. joking. But how about if we go to the, the people that fail three or four times? That's usually one of the things that I often hear when I'm doing some of the phishing engagements and when I'm talking with people and they say well we keep doing this over and over again we have we have bob in hr he's failed four times what do you do with that two things uh well because bob's in hr it's going to be hard to engage hr um but there comes a certain point that it just creates a job opening what oh. right no so that's we'll, not I'll right either no no don't do that Flogging. <laughs> so, so i'm going to back up just a moment i i fully believe in non-punitive outcomes for people clicking on phishing um, so with that, you know, someone clicks on a fish once every three years, whatever. Okay, you know what? Take it on the chin. Get your learning experience. Someone who's consistently failing them, that's a different story. That needs to go through their manager, HR, uh, infosec department, whatever. You may need to put them in a rubber room. You might need to basically sandbox their environment, put them on their own subnet. It's more work than it's probably worth, but it's a, it's a possibility. If it's someone that you either can't get rid of or don't want to get rid of or the company just don't want to adopt that policy. So I would definitely look at it from that perspective. But on the training front, I understand we have our annual check the box compliance training. Sure. Do it. If it has to be an hour, do it an hour. But employee recurring training on a monthly or quarterly basis, uh, somewhere between 15 to 20 minutes in length, just update people on here's the campaigns we ran, here's the statistics on it, uh, here are some threats that we are observing that have nothing to do with our campaigns, uh, and then here are some kudos for people who thwarted phishing attacks or um, you know whatever, but never call out the people who just fell victim and embarrassed them because that's not going to work. Because at the end of the day, I want to when I when I send fish, I want to get reported. It's definitely a, a very strict dichotomy because I want to get reported, but I also want to pwn the world. So I know that if I'm getting reported that everything's working as it should within the organization. And then, you know, obviously the other side. And it's the same same thing for pen testers as well. You know, you want to eventually get in, get your domain admin, do all your fun stuff, at exfiltrate some data. But if you can't, then, you know, if, if someone shuts you down, their sock picks it up and blocks you, great. Um, because I want people to report because when someone says, I'm sorry, I was being dumb. I got this email that said uh, something about insert world event. Uh, we'll say the royal wedding. Um, and I clicked it. Um, they can report that to me. And I now know where to focus my incident response efforts. And I'm not having – I'm able to respond quicker and possibly – mitigate something bigger like ransomware i was uh caught a bit of masha sedona's keynote at source boston and uh it happened to be the part she talked about when she came on the show 
about the reward system that you should use for your employees. And I think, you know, for me, I kind of just thought like, oh, just reward the employees that are reporting phishing or not clicking on things. And, and that's, you know, that's the end of it. But it turns out there's a lot more to the uh, psychology and sociology behind how you reward people. Two things uh, stuck out in my mind. And one of the things she said was, and there was about four or five different ones, right? But the ones I remember are status, right? People really latch on to some sort of sort of status, like whether it's a video game uh, and you're in the you know top three, or you know there's some kind of pecking order uh, about behavior that's rewarding behavior and putting good behavior up the top, giving you a higher status. Um, what was the other thing she said? Uh, in rewarding people, it's not just about like money or monetary value, but giving them something special that they can only get at that particular uh, juncture or event, right? Like she gave the example, like at Source Boston, they had the t-shirt for the conference and you had to physically be there at the conference in order to get the t-shirt. So having some special reward that is uh, specific to and only available as a reward uh, for this. Actually, the best conference giveaway, uh, speaking of you know stuff you'd give away that you can only get at a conference, I got, it was branded by a, a vendor uh, who, who I won't name, but, uh, well, I guess I can. It was a, a TiVo network, so I'll give them props because I like their giveaway. And they were like knockoff gunner glasses. They were the computer glasses, but they said a TiVo networks on the side. And I mean, they're not, I mean, they're free, right? And as far as being able to look at the screen, they work well. They kind of sit a little crooked on your face because, I mean, it's, it was a free giveaway. But I thought that was a really good giveaway, and that's kind of cool because... I can only get one of those if I if I go to a conference. Absolutely. Now, I really want those as giveaways for Security Weekly because I think that was one of... I don't know if you guys agree. We've been to a, a quite a few conferences lately. We've gotten a lot of giveaways. I thought that was one of the best ones. Oh, one of my favorite give giveaways, I just went to a, a, a conference. And there's been a little bit of discussion about this. I don't know what you think about the kind of swag at conferences and how much of it is just ends up being trash and waste. Sure. But what about the kind of swag that I love at a conference? is like free ice cream. Yeah. That, to me, that that's perfect. There's no throwaway, no waste, and who doesn't like ice cream, I guess. But but to yeah. to to what you're saying though about the uh, reward system, and people that are lactose intolerant, just to answer your question. Well, th th there's probably some ways around that as well. I, I don't know if there's real milk in the ice cream anymore, anyway. But oh, that's true. <laughs> that's true. You could have dairy free. It's all just doesn't mean it's not lactose. Some that's kind true. Of frozen true. water just, stuff. Good, good point. But the, with the reward system, I'm wondering how much of it uh, can even be free where people are so afraid of being called out for being caught with the fishing, just kind of reverse it. And every time that somebody does catch the fishing or is really good at the, the fishing training, just call those people out and say, you know, Bob and HR did a great job this time. Yes. Bob was the one who found it. Recognition. And good she, for Bob. Masha talked about that as well. And you've seen other folks that have uh, constructed fishing campaigns. I think Joe might have even talked about it in his uh, right. various confer you know, conference presentations and even here on the show, right? Like rewarding people, part of rewarding people is public recognition. Uh, mm -hmm. and, that, and that certainly speaks for it. Telling that person's manager, right, yep. that they did a good job. Um, and I think we have the same thing. With, and I think Keith and I talked about this, right, in development. If you've got 150 development teams in your organization, or you know, even 50, right? 150 is a very large company, uh, but even if you've got 50, or maybe even 10, find the one development group that you're like, we want to implement this new project with you. They're receptive to that. They're willing to change, and they want to use some new technology or process uh, and test it out. If they do it successfully, highlight that group to the rest of the organization. Say, look at the benefits this group got from implementing this static source code tool to implementing um, uh, DevOps processes in some capacity and, and use that as an example. And the rest, I think the phishing is very similar to highlight the people that are doing a good job. Yeah, I'll never be confused for a, a manager or anything like that. But my understanding is appreciation is like the one thing that employees really thrive on. Everybody wants more money. Everybody wants stuff. But really what people enjoy at their job is being appreciated and people knowing that they're doing a good job. So and, everyone and can work for free now and just well, we just say thank you a lot? And no, absolutely good, right? not. That, oh, no, it doesn't work like that. Yeah, they're, they're it's funny that you say that as well, Patrick, because being a, a, a former Rapid7 Moose myself, uh, that was one of the things that working moose. at Rapid7 was 
like such a such a rewarding experience was they recognize individuals in that organization on uh, just an incredible level um and that was something that i really enjoyed when i was there as well so hey, but you still uh, left yeah. though keith <laughs> I, you know I mean, I'm honestly just throwing that out uh, there <laughs> <laughs> I have I have much love for for my moose at Rapid Seven. In fact, I went and said hi to uh, Kyle Flaherty and a number of other folks uh, while I was at RSA. So there's a lot of love there. Uh, it was not leaving out of spite. It was leaving uh, because the opportunity to come to Bug Crowd was just uh, so good. So um, it was an opportunity to move and grow, and I did. Uh, so that there's that. Uh, I'm but just, yeah, I'm, it, I'm, I'm just he had the chance to get stones, more dude. ice cream. Yes, it, yeah. indeed, that's right. Um, and not to mention, they are also uh, partners on Application Security Weekly, which I am also very grateful for. I thought that that was really cool when that happened. So, um, but with that being said, uh, recognition is so leveraging my psychology degree for a moment. Um, you know, it's it's one of those situations where, as Patrick pointed out, recognition uh, in highlighting the good makes people aspire to be greater and do better. And so to the extent that if you are working in a culture where you're constantly hearing people be berated for doing things badly, um, you probably don't work in a very great culture and you probably have seen a lot of attrition and, and turnover of people in your organization. One of the things that Rapid7 and a number of other companies that I've worked for, including Bug Crowd, does really well is recognizing uh, people that do a very good job in your organization goes 10 times further, if not 100 times further, in terms of getting people to act in a way that they can then also be recognized for that positive behavior. So definitely uh, something to do right is to actually recognize people doing it right in your organization and then highlight that as much as possible because it'll, you know, rising tides will lift all boats, as it were. Now, at, go ahead, Jeff. I? Yes. At, at the risk of going off on too much of a tangent, I, I was thinking about what you said, Keith, and and one of the thoughts I had was, uh, you know, maybe asking your psychology degree, uh, you know, what, what differences are there in terms of effective, you know, motivational rewards, you know, positive feedback type systems, uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, for example, men and women. And, and what I thought of as you were talking was, and this is not a good analogy for everybody because not everybody's, uh, into sports, but, it, you know, when I was younger, I was an athletic trainer, and I used to work uh, very often with the football team. And uh, you know, as any, if anybody's ever seen most coaches that are football coaches, and usually the, the people on the team are men. You know, they're in their faces, they're yelling, they're cursing. Not always during the game, but at practices. And uh, there's a lot of very rough, very aggressive types of reward systems built into that. Whereas on the other hand, I also did athletic training for several women's sports, you know, like field hockey and volleyball and softball and, and basketball. And, and the coaching styles are, were so completely different, you know, the, you know, given, given players hugs and encouraging them, there's a little bit of yelling, but not often. Um, but a very stark contrast in, uh, and they probably wouldn't say, call it a reward system, but certainly motivational. In our context, in our industry, how much do we need to pay attention to the differences in individuals, whether it's male or female, young or old, bald or not, you know, whatever the differences are? So, so to answer your question, Jeff, I would say that paying attention to the individual is incredibly important, and it doesn't come necessarily down to gender, although um, genders, as a, again, a generality uh, for the, the people that identify as a given gender, probably respond in a certain way to certain kinds of behavior. It's interesting with the football analogy. It's not quite Stockholm Syndrome, but you know, having your coach you know, give you a hard time for so long and then give you some praise it's like getting that mm -hmm. little bit of praise was worth it right so so yep. that's that's perhaps the response cycle there it's that little hit of the endorphins in your brain that make you feel good um but at the end of the day paying attention and actually i, I gotta say my former manager so i've moved over to a different team and he's still with bug crowd um is the vp of trust and security jason haddocks did an excellent job of this where he he straight out asked me uh, in our one-on-one, -on -one. what is the way in which you want to be recognized within the organization that makes you feel good? 
Is it, you know, calling you out publicly on our Slack channel? Is it calling you out publicly on, uh, you know, a group meeting? Is it just telling you one on one that I've got positive feedback about you? What works best for you? And honestly, I think that that was probably one of the nicest things that he ever did was he asked me how I wanted to be recognized as a player within the organization. And it, it uh, you know, served my career well. And to that end, it has made him an incredible manager. Well, so. and Keith and, and Jeff both, you know, I think that um, it's important to recognize the individual and understand the individual uh, and have empathy for your employees and everyone that you work with, right? Um, but also beyond an individual level, I think it's a cult- cultural level as well that the company is going to create whether by choice or whether by accident, some form of culture. There might be different cultures in different areas of your organization. And to Jeff's point, uh, and Keith's too, to a certain extent, I think that the reward system uh, and how it works might be slightly unique, maybe not completely unique, but slightly unique to the different culture uh, cultures in your organization. And maybe that's on a department level too. Uh, you know, when I worked for one of the companies early on in my career, there was a group whose job it was to travel to all of the sites and spend months and months and months on site, then come back for a little while and basically like do that again. I mean, they had their own, their own culture because they all worked together, experienced the same things. They were doing a drastically different job in a drastically different way than say software engineers that very rarely traveled, security people and IT people that didn't travel quite as much sometimes the culture was just different. So I think how you structure a reward, their reward, their manager's understanding of what, what they want and what they might need might be different. Their reward might be, you get to spend some more time at home or their reward might be, you get to go off and go to this next place that everyone was fighting over because you did a good job. Like you get to go to Hawaii. And by the way, you know, you get to go to Regina, Saskatchewan. <laughs> that might be a thing. And their culture might be okay with that. that that's a rewards-based system. But the point is, it's very different from a software engineer that may think of rewards as a different thing, right? It might be time off. It might be you get to go to uh, training, like you get higher up on the training list, whatever the case may be. You get a more comfortable chair. I mean, even like silly things like that matter a lot. And it's different but, for every group. But that begs in, in the some question, ways it, Paul. Um, that begs the question, you know, organizations, especially larger organizations, you know, what we're all describing sounds like a lot of work to get to know individuals and groups and everything like that. I, I got to believe in this context, like in so many other contexts within security, you know, our our customers are going to go, yeah, 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 just tell me what I need to buy so I can check the box and, and move on. Uh, this all sounds great, but I got a business to run. So I think we're back to or coming full circle back to, uh, you know, programs and techniques and, and automation. And we're back to uh, phishing campaigns. Well, and I, my, my other point, Jeff, is along those lines. So as we automate things and have more uh, different types of reward systems that are, are part of a program or even software, mm-hmm. how do you prevent people from cheating the system? And Keith and I talked about this. Uh, Keith, when we were on ASW and we talked about bug bounty rewards in open source software that I think it was Git or, or someone was finding Google. vulnerabilities Google. and you were reward it was Google and you were rewarded if you fixed that vulnerability within a certain time window. Masha also mm-hmm. talked about this type of reward system for individuals working for a company and that they're rewarded if they fix a bug. Uh, so Masha was talking about it on an organizational level. Google's doing it on a larger community level. The fear in both of those is what if I introduce a bug just so I can fix it quickly, so I can get the reward. And that's what Keith and I talked about right. with, with the Google right. program. Or even pair similar, up with somebody and do that. Right? Exactly. And it's similar for, yep. uh, I, I think, individual uh, groups within your organization that might have the reward system. So um, on the topic of the actual rewards, uh, some of the things that I recommend uh, in terms of rewarding, uh, a parking spot, a T-shirt, stress balls. Um, you could even go as far as challenge coins. Um Anything of value, Starbucks, Amazon gift card. But um, the other thing I always caution of is be cautious of how you reward um, and how much of a game you make it because I reference Wells Fargo and what they were doing with their employees basically having quotas on new accounts created and the employees just started creating bogus accounts. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. From the same yep. sense, if it was if you created like something to the effect of the person who reports the most phishing emails in a month gets – the CEO's parking spot, I don't know, something. Um, 
they're just going to go and get on a bunch of phishing lists and report everything. So you do have to worry about the abuse case scenario, which, I mean, as security people, we should always be thinking about the abuse case scenario, whether it be social engineering, uh, security architecture, uh, pen testing, network design, whatever. We always need to think about the abuse case scenario. Here's how, here's how this is meant to operate. How can we misuse it? And, and to that yeah, end, if you get people really in the organization joke. doing that, bring them onto your hacking team because they're doing what you do. True. And, and the other side of it is it, it's show me how it's measured and I'll show you how it's made. And, and to that end, you kind of want to have the random feedback cycle, right? So to the extent that it's like they don't get a reward every time because learning ultimately happens when you get randomization added in. So the first few times in your training a pet or you know, you're you're working on trying to train something, if you reward the first few times, there's an expectation for a reward, and then you randomize the rewards thereafter, people learn, and people actually retain that learning over time without losing that, it. That's very Pavlovian of you, Keith. <laughs> <laughs> it is. And that was for Paul's benefit. I think that was the first time we've used the word Pavlovian on the show before. I love that. Um, so Anybody got a bell? Can we bring a bell? With, yeah. <laughs> ding, ding, end all, of all segment. All of a sudden, I'm salivating. That's right. Um, so with that, we're gonna, I'm going to end this segment. Um, we've welcomed Joff to the show. He's going to join us uh, in the next segment where I'm going to talk about that one time in AWS where we kind of got hacked. Oops. Uh, and the, the really lame malware that uh, resulted. So stay tuned. We'll be right back.